interested in taking a deep dive each week into a compliance or compliance-related topic? Then Compliance Into the Weeds is the podcast for you. Join Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, and Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, as they go into the weeds to flesh out a story which you can use to better inform your compliance program. Both you and your compliance program will be the better for listening to this podcast. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this final episode of 2020, we take up the issue of who should oversee your hotline and who should manage it. It's a fascinating discussion that Matt and I have to end this most tumultuous year of Compliance Into the Weeds. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. This is our first post-Christmas podcast. So, uh, Matt, first of all, welcome back, and I hope you guys had a very happy holidays. Uh, We did indeed, Tom, and I hope all the listeners did too. And now we can all just glide into 2021 and uh, wish 2020 to the dustbin dustbin of history. Good riddance to it. Amen. Well, Matt, you posted, uh, I believe yesterday, uh, I thought was a really interesting uh, blog post entitled, Who Should Run the Hotline? You want to tell us the genesis of it and uh, where you sort of uh, came out with your initial thoughts? Yeah. So this was just a question that a compliance acquaintance of mine asked me. Uh, We are connected on LinkedIn and we chat from time to time. And this person, uh, he didn't specifically say, yes, I can tell you his whole story. So I have to slightly anonymize it. But he hails from the Asia-Pacific region in a second-tier country, not Japan, not South Korea, not Singapore, where they might have fairly modern corporate governance standards, uh, not China either, uh, one of the smaller secondary countries in the Asia-Pacific region, where he just asked me, and he is a fairly um, active in corporate consulting in that country. He uh, is a longtime audit professional there and dabbles in corporate compliance as well. He serves on boards in this country, and he consults with other businesses in this country. Uh, so he just asked me one day, uh, he has a client. What sort of client? Is it a state-owned business? What industry? I don't know. Uh, but he said, the client is wondering who should be in charge of the internal hotline, the compliance team, legal counsel, or internal audit, and when should that function report issues to the audit committee? Our reason for asking is that the client doesn't want the CEO to be directly involved in handling internal complaints. I often read articles uh, in the West in business uh, magazines um, like the Wall Street Journal and some others, he says. I often read articles that recommend companies use a balanced approach, quote unquote, but what is that approach specifically? Can the audit committee be informed immediately upon receipt of any serious whistleblower matter? That was his question to me, and I started writing about um, how I would frame that and who should be in charge of the hotline on a daily basis, what the audit committee should be thinking about since they are nominally at the very top and would oversee internal complaints as an issue that somebody somewhere working for the audit committee has to take care of. What's their role and responsibility? Who's the internal person with roles and responsibility for the hotline? And I realized there was enough for a post here, and we can get into the details of it, but I thought it was a fascinating question. Even though it might seem somewhat basic, there's a lot of nuance and complexity to consider about hotlines. So that's why we are here today. Well, Matt, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Lots of nuance and complexity. And um, why or where should it start? And why should it be with uh, the place you begin it uh, starting? Well, I began by telling him that this does actually start with the audit committee. And it was somewhat striking where he had said, can the audit committee be informed immediately upon receipt of any serious whistleblower matter? And my first thought was, well, dude, they're the audit committee. They can do whatever they want, pretty much. Um, They have ultimate responsibility for all of these issues. Uh, they are probably the most important committee in the board, so they get to say what it is that the organization is going to do to encourage whistleblower complaints, to have a strong internal reporting culture, and to decide that the processes to handle internal complaints are sufficient. 
Um, what are those complaints? Are the processes actually going to be, you know, the audit committee doesn't have to get too far into the weeds of that, but they do get the final say to say, yes, we like this process. No, we don't like this. So right away, I mean, of course, this begins with the audit committee. It also ends with the audit committee. Um, and uh, so I was immediately thinking that what we should focus in on is whoever might run the internal hotline on a daily basis. And we can discuss that in a few minutes, who that person is. But whomever it might be, compliance, internal audit, legal, the janitor, it's more important that that person has a clear path to bring hotline complaints to the audit committee whenever he or she wants. And my recommendation then would be that the audit committee should sort of back into empowering that official by putting right in their charter what they expect and their demand for bringing hotline complaints to them. They could maybe leave open exactly who that person is, but I would recommend something like, right there in their charter, write this down, the audit committee shall be informed of whistleblower reports anytime the report involves allegations of all the usual stuff, accounting fraud, inter- inaccurate financial reporting, regulatory compliance issues. You could even add in cybersecurity or whatever else if you want, but frame it as the audit committee shall be informed. And therefore, whoever does the informing can always say to whomever might want to obstruct that reporting, get out of my way. It is my job to bring this to the audit committee. It is their demand that they have these reports brought directly to them, and I'm just fulfilling what they want. And that sort of empowers and protects the whistleblower hotline manager. I know it's not going to be um, a perfect solution. Are you still going to risk retaliation and pushback from, say, a CEO or a general counsel? Yes, you are. That's always going to be present with us. But being able to say the audit committee itself specifies that this matter must be brought to the committee immediately. I have no choice but to bring it to them. And you, nefarious meddling executive, you don't get a veto in this. Um, I get to go around you. That's the condition that I think companies want to create. So putting it right into the charter of the audit committee, that's what I would do for starters. Um, we can get it to who this person is who's running it on a daily basis later, but like I said before, Tom, it's the audit committee begins and ends with this. So therefore, they really have to codify that it does begin and end with them having a clear pipeline into whistleblower reports. It also brought up for me uh, some of the issues around uh, whether the person or group managing the, the hotline has sufficient support for it. So, for instance, is their budget Is there a competent hotline uh, company running it? And, of course, your uh, point on uh, the reporting, uh, direct reporting, the – and it made me think that it's it's really the execution of the hotline and the reporting culture of the company is where the rubber uh, meets the road. So what were some of your thoughts on who should manage the uh, hotline system, Matt? It's a tricky question, and it gets right back to what my friend who asked the question, he was a bit frustrated by so many of these articles say, well, who should run it kind of depends on this and that. But honestly, it kind of depends on this and that, Um, depends on the industry that you're in, the size of the company, the complexity of the company, how many employees are actually there. But when you think about the the two essential qualities that – or a capabilities that this hotline manager should have. First and foremost, the manager should be independent so they can follow an allegation that comes in over the hotline wherever it may lead, including to uncomfortable areas such as allegations against a senior executive or the general counsel or even another member of the uh, the board. Um, but you need independence rather than some sort of subordinate attention to legal issues or financial issues or even just the CEO not wanting bad news to get to the audit committee. Um, and the other quantity or capability that the person needs is competence to actually handle investigations effectively. Um, so the person running the hotline needs both of those things, independence and competence. 
It gets a little tricky because my original friend there, he asked, could internal audit run a hotline? I would not recommend that. Yes, they do have independence, which is good, but internal audit generally is not going to have a lot of investigations expertise, especially if we get into matters of law and regulatory compliance or really difficult issues around, say, workplace harassment where you're investigating human beings and who said what or who did what to whom. Um, that can get really difficult and tricky. That's not what auditors are trained to do. That's not what they do when they're performing internal audits. I know we could say an auditor could then have authority to hire outside counsel who would be versed in this, and I suppose that could work, but like, why are we doing this, folks? Internal audits should be doing internal audits and perhaps helping somebody else with some investigations, but they are not investigative people, regardless of how independent they are. On the flip side, we have people like compliance officers who are much more versed in handling investigations and can handle regulatory compliance and matters of law most of the time. The drawback there might be that they don't have the independence, especially if they do report into the general counsel or the CFO or somebody else like that. So there's a couple of different considerations that you have to think through. If I could wave a magic wand, I would say the person running the hotline should be the compliance officer who does not report to the general counsel, maybe reports to the CEO, but ideally reports directly to the audit committee, especially on matters of internal hotlines and complaints. Um, how many companies are really going to have that perfect setup? Probably not many. Um, probably most that do are going to be very large. What do you do if you're small and you don't have an audit function at all? What if you don't really even have a compliance function? Uh, what's interesting, Tom, is I posted this uh, article on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and I got a bunch of people who said, you can do this any number of ways, but never give it to the HR function. And that did catch me by surprise because HR can kind of sort of do investigations. Um, but one person, and forensics investigator, even said, oh, yeah, sure, give it to the HR function because my job is to come in and clean up investigations that you've already screwed up. And giving complaints to the HR function is a great way for me to be employed. So I got a lot of really interesting answers, but that's a lot of the complexity that's out there. Matt, did anyone comment on whether or not uh, the legal department should be the repository of compliance complaints, or excuse me, of hotline complaints? Uh, only to say that that's really going to be a bad idea. I think um, it might be a necessary idea if you're not large enough to have an independent compliance function. Uh, I, I get the sense a lot of people thought, okay, in reality, you're probably going to have compliance report in the legal. It's not ideal, but somehow think about independence. Like That was as close to, as anybody got to saying, okay, legal can do it. Very few people actually were thrilled with the idea that legal might run the internal hotline because what happens if you get a complaint that is either about the legal team or the general counsel or that puts the ethics and compliance concerns of the company pits that against the legal liability issues that the general counsel is thinking about, because the general counsel's job is to reduce legal liability. It's not necessarily to do the ethical thing, which might be to step up and admit you made a mistake and then have the regulators take you out to the woodshed. Um, there's plenty of people who would say if you have corporate misconduct, you could clean it up, not report it, hope that the regulators never get wind of it, and no harm, no foul. Now, I don't agree with that idea, but I know there are people out there who think that it's possible and you can get away with it, um, and those people will tend to be corporate counsel. So there's, it's not an ideal situation, but I respect the reality that a lot of smaller companies are not going to have a big, sophisticated internal reporting function. They're not going to have an independent compliance function. In that case, who does do it? It shouldn't be HR. That was crystal clear from just about everybody. Um, so you're kind of stuck with... It's going to be legal who eventually is the, um, the middle layer between the audit committee and the professionals who run your actual hotline, like the, I don't know, the, the outsourced compliance uh, hotline providers of the world. We are able, I think, to assess the independence of the group managing the hotline 
But Matt, how would a audit committee assess competence of the management of a hotline or a group managing that? Well, I mean, they would do that by having a compliance professional on the audit committee, which is where everybody listening says, yeah, damn right. And I, I hear your fists pumping in the air right now as I say that. In reality, uh, that could be very difficult to do because most audit committees are not going to have a compliance professional on board. Um, they are not going to necessarily have the same sophistication with compliance pr- uh, expertise as they would, say, with financial matters or cybersecurity matters because IT security is the other thing that audit committees always want to have on the board. Um, so I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, they need to be thinking through how they can assess the effectiveness of the compliance program effectively. In theory, the audit committee could hire an outside evaluator to report directly to them. They could have the internal audit function, look at the hotline program and the compliance function and report directly to them. Um, It's still even, uh, look, I love internal auditors, but that's still not the ideal because a lot of internal auditors do face the same pressure for politically correct findings Um, that compliance officers feel when they get very difficult or awkward internal reports. Uh, That happens with internal audit as well. Um, So it's not going to be easy. But, Tom, I do think you raise a good point that that the audit committee needs to be sure its compliance function in all its glory, and that includes the hotline, that the compliance function is fit for purpose. And how does the audit committee know that it has the right evaluation expertise to do that? Like, it's kind of sketchy, but it's, it's worth thinking about. Matt, you talked about the audit committee having written to, into its charter uh, its roles and responsibilities around a hotline. Do you think that that sort of written uh, guidance, or if I could even maybe change it to uh, controls or policies and procedures, should be written into the description of the group that manages the hotline as well? Uh, That was the other part that I don't really think I fleshed that out in my post as much as I'd like. But as much as the audit committee in its charter should talk about how a strong internal reporting function should exist and how the line should be clear, the actual job description or the department charter or any other relevant documents for the in-house people running the hotline should be in alignment with that, uh, that the audit committee has in its charter. So, for example, the job description of, let's say, the chief compliance officer should say something along the lines of, runs the internal reporting hotline, and the hotline concerns can be brought directly to the audit committee at any time the compliance officer sees fit. Something that along those lines that complements what the audit committee says it wants Um, The job descriptions and the internal charters and everything else should say what the compliance person should be providing as head of the internal reporting hotline. You know, Matt, it turns out there's really a lot to think about here. And I wonder if corporations really take the time to to consider these issues or it's simply, oh, we go to and, and we all know some of the major hotline providers. We get a hotline, we put it in, we tell the CCO, uh, go forth, take down the numbers, report to us on the audit committee, and that's it. You know, I think that's a very good point. And one thing that I did include in my post was, let's remember, a lot of regulators will look at how the company is handling internal complaints and whether its internal hotline capabilities are sufficient for the risks that it's trying to manage. And, Tom, over the summer, uh, you and I did a talk about Citigroup, uh, where they got hit by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the Fed for having really messy risk management programs. And I did a big four-part look at all of the settlement orders and everything else. But the banking regulators zeroed right in on responsibilities for Citigroup's board and its subdivision, Citibank, and its board, too, that one of the board's duties was to be able to assess their internal reporting systems and to make sure that those systems that to collect and track and escalate employee uh, complaints to the board when necessary, that those things all worked well. And I've seen that sort of marching order from banking regulators to banks quite a lot. And I suspect if we looked in other industries, we'd see it the same. 
is that the regulators are telling boards themselves, you need to make sure that the system of internal reporting, how you generate complaints, how you track them, and how you escalate them, all the way up to the board when necessary, that that works well. That is a board responsibility you need to take care of. And taking care of it means putting the right people in the organization in charge of the hotline on a daily basis. Um, so that, like, there, there is really a lot to think about here, and a lot of large companies have not thought about it well because they've been dinged by regulators who have told them, you need to think about this better. So it, it's not something to be ignored at all. Well, Matt, this has been just a fascinating exploration of a topic that obviously does not get enough in-depth uh, analysis. So keep those cards and letters coming to the coolest guy in compliance. We're getting some great podcasts out of it. Thank you very much, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. Also, check out the show notes where I have additional resources available in forms of blog posts written by Matt or myself. I hope you'll join Matt and I again next week where we take another deep dive, literally going into the compliance weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. We look forward to visiting with you again.